Welcome to True Crime Craft Time. This is a murder, mystery, and master boards series. In each episode, I will delve into a true crime murder or an unresolved mystery while I make a master board from one of the 13 design styles to choose from. Each episode will feature one custom collage master board made on the fly and one true crime or mystery story. So sit back, grab some coffee and a snack, watch me make a master board while I tell you a story. December 16, 2004, Skidmore, Missouri. The weather was in the mid 60s, cold but not freezing. Lisa Montgomery and Bobby Jo Stinnett were two women from two completely different worlds until one day their lives collided. This collision would lead to one of the most graphic and disturbing murder cases Missouri had ever seen. Bobby Jo Stinnett, born December 4, 1981, was an eight-month pregnant 23-year-old American woman, a graduate of Nottaway Holt High School in Graham, Missouri in 2000. She married and was going to have her first child in one month. Bobby Jo and her husband ran a dog breeding business from their home, specializing in rat terriers. They were part of an online rat terrier chat room called, quote, Ratter Chatter, unquote, which is how she initially came into contact with Lisa Montgomery. Lisa told her she was also pregnant, and so the two women chatted online and exchanged emails about their pregnancies. Eventually, Lisa was able to secure the home address of Bobby Joe, posing as a prospective customer named Darlene Fisher rather than her own name. It is not clear whether Lisa joined the online club under her real name or under the pseudonym from the very beginning. Before I tell you what happened, let me tell you a bit more about Lisa Montgomery and her childhood. Lisa Marie Montgomery was born February 27, 1968 and resided in Melbourne, Kansas. Her mother was addicted to alcohol and this led to Lisa being born with fetal alcohol syndrome. Her first introduction to sexual experiences occurred when she was only three lying in bed next to her older half-sister, Diane. Diane was then eight and being raped by their male babysitter. When Lisa was 11, she discovered what it was like to be raped herself. Her stepfather, Jack Kleiner, was a mean drunk himself, and he regularly beat Lisa and her mother. So at age 11, he began raping Lisa once or twice a week. Jack even built a room for Lisa on the side of their trailer in the Oklahoma woods. He had a private entrance so that he could come and go as he pleased. He also created a peephole in his closet so he could spy on her 24-7. He would rape and sodomize her, often using a pillow to smother her face and screams. If she resisted, he slammed her head so hard against the concrete floor she suffered brain trauma as a result. One day, Lisa's mother, Judy Shaughnessy, happened to enter the room while Lisa was being assaulted by Jack. Instead of protecting Lisa, Judy fetched a gun and held it to her daughter's head, screaming, How could you do this to me? Rather than the abuse stopping, it expanded. Lisa's stepfather, Jack Kleiner, invited friends around to gang rape her in her room. 
these gang rapes lasted hours and often ended with the men urinating on her as if she was fallen leaves out in the woods. Not to be left out, Lisa's mother had her own plans, selling Lisa's body to the plumber and electrician whenever she needed odd jobs done around the home. Details are scant about Lisa's life as she became an adult. She tried to escape at age 18 by a forced marriage to her stepbrother and later a second marriage, which also resulted in further abuse. Consequently, she had four children in five years with her first husband, after which she underwent a forced tubal ligation in 1990. Unhappy over the sterilization, she was said to falsely claim she was pregnant several times, according to her first and second husbands. It is speculated that she was trying to get custody of her children. Producing a baby of her own would dispel the accusations her husbands lodged about being pregnant. That is why Lisa chatted online with Bobby Joe, the pregnant woman, learning her address and details about her life and pregnancy. She attended the same dog shows as Bobby Joe and even had a picture taken of the two of them at one of the shows in Abilene, Kansas. At the same time, Lisa indulged in watching videos and web content about various forms of home births, C-sections, and how to deliver unassisted home births. Meanwhile, she bragged to the dog chat group that she was pregnant. Members of the chat group described Bobby Joe as shy, but, quote, a sweetheart after you got to know her, unquote. Apparently, Lisa also sold dogs and was once accused of misrepresenting to the group the pedigree of dogs she sold. However, Bobby Joe stood up for her. Bobby Joe said it was, quote, probably just a misunderstanding, unquote. Bobby Joe was a trusting person and regarded as an expert on the breed and convinced the dog chatters to give Lisa another chance. So it was when Lisa announced she was pregnant, members of the group did not believe her. Then Lisa announced to everyone she was pregnant with twins, but lost one to complications. She claimed doctors were able to save one of the babies. The group did not believe her, but apparently she was able to fool her family and community. So it was on a cold December day in 2004, Lisa, now aged 36, traveled from her home in Kansas to the tiny town of Skidmore, Missouri, some two hours away, to meet up with Bobby Joe Stinnett. Lisa, posing in essence to buy a puppy, went to Bobby Joe's home. Once inside the house, she attacked Bobby Joe and strangled her to death with a rope. She then cut out the fetus using a kitchen paring knife, removed the premature fetus from her mother's womb, and made the two-hour return trip to her home with the baby, passing her off as her own. Later that day, she claimed online that she had just given birth to her baby at a clinic in another town. Meanwhile, Bobby Joe's mother, Becky, discovered her lifeless body on the floor and called 911. She described it as looking like her abdomen had exploded. There were ligature marks on her neck from strangulation, blood all over the floor, and fingerprints and footprints in the blood. It did not take law enforcement long to figure out who the murderer was. Looking at Bobby Joe's computer, email exchanges, possibly phone records, and interviewing family and friends, they quickly identified Lisa Montgomery, and the next day detectives went to her old white farmhouse. They found Lisa sitting on her sofa, the baby next to her. 
Wanting to separate the two of them in a safe manner, the lead detective asked if he might hold the baby. Lisa gave him permission. Once the infant was safely removed from Lisa, the officers arrested her and charged her with murder and kidnapping. When being questioned at police headquarters, the detective put his hand on Lisa's and she put her other hand on top of his. He could see blood still under her fingernails. They found bandages, gauze, and a suction tool in her car, and so officers knew the murder was premeditated. And for one month prior to the fateful day, they found evidence on Lisa's computer of her grooming and befriending Bobby Joe, watching 30 videos of C-sections and 370 times searching for information on unassisted home births. She had even claimed another woman's ultrasound image as her own. She had even studied underwater births. In 2007, Lisa was convicted of first-degree murder and kidnapping. She was represented by a public defense lawyer who had never tried a capital case and by Fred Duchard, a Kansas City attorney with a particular claim to fame. In 2016, Duchard held the distinction of having more clients sentenced to death in federal court than any other defense lawyer in America. Four out of seven federal death inmates from Missouri had the misfortune to have him as their attorney. His strategy at trial was to claim Lisa suffered from a rare mental illness called pseudocysis, which caused Lisa to think Bobby Joe's baby was actually hers. This theory, of course, did not fit the facts, and the jury didn't buy it. And for some strange reason, very limited mitigating evidence was presented to them at the sentencing phase of the trial. They cited some evidence of physical abuse, called in some unprepared witnesses, and that was the extent of their defense. Their thinly argued plea of, quote, abuse excuse, unquote, to spare her the death penalty was easily lampooned by the prosecution. And so Lisa Montgomery was condemned to death on October 26, 2007. It wasn't until new defense lawyers, Kelly Henry and Amy Harwell, were assigned to her case that more in-depth investigation was done into Lisa's childhood. A clinical social worker, Janet Vogelsang, spent several long days interviewing Lisa, gaining her trust and learning about even more childhood trauma. She observed that Lisa spoke like some Vietnam and Korean War veterans who had been held in holes and bamboo cages under horrible conditions. Ms. Vogelsang eventually wrote a 184-page history of Lisa's life growing up. There were the pre-known issues of sexual assaults and gang rapes, the sexual trafficking and violence, but that was the tip of the iceberg. There was also constant demeaning and humiliation. For example, Lisa's mother, Becky, would put duct tape over her mouth to prevent her from talking. She was stripped naked and made to stand on the porch in front of drunken visitors, then told she would be sent away to a home if she made the slightest noise. Her parents made her beat her younger sister with a board until the girl bled. Then there was the room on the side of the trailer where her stepfather abused her, not just sexually, but in the depths of her psyche. To find some place in the room where her stepfather could not see her, she would stand and literally curl up in the corner for hours just to stay out of his field of vision. The social worker found that Lisa was treated just like child soldiers and prisoners of war. Isolated, brainwashed, humiliated and degraded, not allowed to speak, 
and beaten at will. Further, she said Lisa, quote, lives in a state of disassociation, going in and out all the time, unquote. She would display an inability to connect to her emotions with blank facial expression, blank voice, talking about herself in the third person. Ultimately, the prison system psychiatric care and analysis diagnosed Lisa with the following. Bipolar disorder, PTSD, anxiety and depression, psychosis, mood swings, disassociation, and memory loss. There was proof she was grappling with these conditions before and leading immediately up to the committing of the murder and kidnapping. Her claims of pregnancy were obviously false since she had been sterilized after the birth of her fourth child. Despite all this, no one ever came to her assistance or offered her any protection or help. Society failed her, and the crime of doing nothing is almost as terrible as the crime she committed. Her stepfather was never prosecuted, nor was her mother. Only once throughout her entire rotten childhood did social workers pay the family a visit, and even then they called her parents ahead of time so that they were able to enforce Lisa's silence upon threats of death if she spoke up. There was a doctor in Oklahoma who examined her as a child, learned about the regular rapes, and did nothing about it. The Child Welfare Office informed of the abuse did nothing about it. The family court judge who presided at the parents' divorce, who actually scolded Lisa's mother for failing to report the rape of her daughter to police, then himself did absolutely nothing about it. On March 19, 2012, the U.S. Supreme Court denied Lisa's petition. She was scheduled for execution by lethal injection for December 2020, but this was delayed because her attorneys contracted COVID-19. Then on January 1, 2021, a three-judge panel on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit reinstated her execution date to January 12. Judge Patrick Hennion granted a stay of execution on the grounds that her mental competence must first be tested as it could be argued that she did not understand the grounds for her execution. However, the stay was vacated by the Supreme Court in a 6-3 vote. And so on January 13, 2021, Lisa Marie Montgomery was executed by lethal injection in Terre Haute, Indiana. When asked if she had any last words, she responded, no. This made her the first female federal prisoner to be executed in 67 years. And according to Jessica Lessenhop of the BBC, quote, most Skidmore residents supported the execution, unquote. Sixteen years ago, Bobby Jo Stinnett's hometown of Marysville, Missouri, had reeled from the gruesome crime. Hundreds of mourners gathered in the small northwestern farming community of Skidmore, Missouri, for her funeral. The crowd filled the Price Funeral Home and overflowed into the entrance for the service. Cars lined the streets on a bitter cold day. Many mourners were unable to get into the service. Others, some crying and exchanging hugs, took turns letting each other get closer to the sanctuary, the Skidmore Christian Church. One tearful mourner carried a dozen pink roses, but became so distraught she had to be escorted outside. Afterward, pallbearers waited outside as the gold coffin was placed into a hearse. She was buried the next day. I've known her since she was a baby, 
said a family friend. She grew up into a beautiful swan. Baby Victoria Jo was released from the hospital the night before her mom was to be buried in Skidmore. The infant was given back to her dad, Zeb Stinnett, who has raised her with support from his and Bobby Joe's families. The girl's relatives appear to have gone to great lengths to protect her from the media glare since the horrific attack. She has remained out of the public eye and rang in her 16th birthday last December 2020, which is also, of course, the anniversary of her mom's death. So what do you think about Lisa and Bobby Joe? I have my opinion, but I'd like to know yours. After all, I'm just an old gal making master boards on the internet.
That's it for this episode of Murder, Mystery, and Masterboards. Tune in to the next one where I will make a different masterboard and tell you a different story. Until then, this is Miss Darling calling this a wrap. Bye-bye.